Well, hello. My name's Penny. I live in the southeast of England with my husband Pete and my four chickens. And you are most welcome. And I've had so many new subscribers. Well, it's just an absolute thrill. I was trying to wonder how the uh, YouTube algorithm worked. And I got some lovely messages um, from people saying, really, we don't fit into a, a YouTube algorithm because we do so many different things. And you'll think it's a set up job. You'll think I mentioned Helen and so she mentioned me or I mentioned her because she mentioned, no, we both didn't know. She messaged and said, it's so funny because I've just uploaded my video, my vlog, and I've mentioned you. And I was doing my vlog and mentioning her. So we've just gone like that. And we've gone like that as well because I had my episode planned and I was going to, I always tell you a fascinating fact. I like the way science fits in with nature. And I found a little bit on seashells and I love seashells. I've got a special pot with all the shells that I've collected from Tresco. So yes, little film on my seashells. And what did Helen show but her treasured seashells? But it's not a put up job, we're not in cahoots. It's just that we must be on the same page, Helen. I don't know how you feel about that. Welcome to all you new people. Thank you so much. It means such a lot to me. For those of you that haven't seen, I knitted my grandson, or my darling little Nicholas. That's what he was, my darling little Nicholas. He came round to our house one day and he arrived on the drive. We had an in and out drive then. We downsized 22 years ago, which wasn't a good idea. I regret it now. But there you are, it was the right decision at the right time. But for me, I pine for my old house and I want more space, but never mind. Anyway, he came in and there he is on this bike, never seen him on a bike before. I said, Nicholas, how are you riding that? With confidence and balance, Nan. He was seven. With confidence and balance. Well, my confidence and balance little guy has now got this size feet. And he likes snazzy shot socks. So I knitted them. They do go with the wallpaper. Anyway, these are his socks. So they're going to wing their way to him now. What else did I make? Oh, I got a new phone, but I made myself a case. Only took a minute. I did put a little bit round the edge because they're quite wide, aren't they, the phones? And did it with my lovely Tilda because I love Tilda. Anybody who knows, knows me, knows I love Tilda. And, well, that's not too bad. I only had black elastic. I didn't have any white. I just made it from my stash. I went upstairs and thought, oh, let's knock one up. And it's come out all right. I'm pleased with it. So there it is, nice and padded both sides and my phone fits in lovely. So that's what I made, it didn't take me long. There it is, fits in there lovely. So that's been done. Oh, Tom is dropping by to see me tomorrow. Now, if you don't know, Tom is my new little great grandson and I do meeting, meet him on Chinwag for the first time. So when you come across that episode, I hope you enjoy it. I was very emotional. And um, yeah, but I haven't seen him because of the way things are here. But she's feeling well. She's testing negative. She had COVID the week before he was born. That wasn't fun. Um, but he's doing well. And she's going to pop by tomorrow. So I might um, take a little film and put it up next week. So I did knit him a little pair of socks. You'll see in a little ep in an episode earlier. But when during lockdown and that, I sent off some wool for Stuart Yarns, and it was drinks. It was linked to drink. It is the softest wool I've ever felt, and I thought it'd be lovely for babies' feet. But it's iron brew, and uh, if you if you catch up with me eventually, you'll know I did my DNA test. And um, I am half Scottish, come from the northeast of Scotland, Peterhead. 
and I'm very proud of it too because I can speak Doric. Fujidus means how are you? Pekinawa means I'm doing well. Um, yeah, it literally means how's your pigeons? Uh, yeah, Pekinawa, doing well. But that is Doric for how are you? Fujidus. I like it. Anyway, this is Iron Brew. It's a soft drink, but it's Scot Scotland's national drink. And I got that just because I sent off for the drink of the month. I didn't know what it was going to be. I didn't mind because it's so soft. And so I've literally almost finished. I should have finished it before I came on here, but I've been busy. Busy bee. So I've literally just, I mean, how long is it going to take me? Half an hour. But here's this little sock. This little iron brew sock. Just, um... Yeah, it's cute, isn't it? And this apparently is a pattern that I'll link it below, uh, but it doesn't come off. Baby's feet, it doesn't come off, it stays on. And so I, I knitted a pair for him and he's worn them ever since he was born. And she said, Nan, they never come off. So I'm really pleased. Anyway, that's his little sock. So I've been doing that this week. And then I realised there's one whip work in progress that I haven't shown you, and that's my blanket. And this is a long work in progress, and one that I'm thoroughly enjoying. I'm doing it, and um, anybody who doesn't really knit, but just does knit stitches, just likes to do a knit stitch. This is all garter stitch, we call it, knit garter stitch. And it's a corner to corner blanket. There's the corner. Uh, I'm going to do quite a bit more. That's what I've done so far. Can you see that? It's called the Habitation Throw. If you want, it's a beautifully written pattern. And um, for a beginner, it would be ideal. But even for me, it's just lovely to sit there, not have to think. And I'm using up all my little, you know, bits and bobs from the socks and from the from the shawls I've knitted and everything like that. And the floof that I'm knitting it with is uh, cashmere and silk. So it does feel so gorgeous. That might be for mum or it might be for me. Depends who wants it. So that's that. So that is a work in progress. So what I do each week is I do this fascinating fact. And this week it's about shells. So I'll see you the other side of that. And... I could have put photographs of shells up, but I have a lovely little collection of shells because we love the Isles of Scilly and we go there every year. We haven't been for two years and we're not going again this year because we can't face the shallow shantai arming and haring. Um, so we've cancelled. But uh, usually we do. We have been going there for the last 15 years every year. And I've got a nice collection of, collection of seashells and the, the beaches there are, are white, you know, like they are in Scotland. They're beautiful. And uh, so I'm going to show you my collection of seashells whilst I tell you the fascinating fact how science has linked in with that. So I'll see you the other side. Seashells enable mollusks to live in harsh conditions, resisting tremendous pressures on the seabed. This ability to provide optimum protection inspired engineers to study the shape and structure of seashells with a view to designing vehicles and buildings that would protect their occupants. Engineers analysed two seashell forms, bivalve, clamshell style, and spiral, screw shaped. In the case of the bivalve, it was found that the ribbing on the exterior of the shell directed stresses towards its hinge and outer edges. In contrast, the curving exterior of a spiral shell directed pressure towards its core and wide top. In both cases, the seashell shapes channeled pressure to their strongest areas, meaning that in the event of damage, harm to the mollusk would be less likely. Researchers also ran comparative tests on real shells and on simple hemispheres and cones that mimicked shell shapes and composition. The results showed that natural seashells 
complex surfaces nearly doubled their ability to withstand pressure when compared to the simple shapes. Commenting on the applications of this research, Scientific American says, if you wind up driving a shell-shaped car someday, it'll be both stylish and designed to protect the soft bodies inside. Now, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to put up a little bit here where I made a chocolate cake. Now, Pete does say at the end what he thinks about it, and so I take that on board and I do put the rest of the chocolate that's left over from what the recipe says on the top. So it's delicious. It really, well, I think it's delicious. So there's me, just you know. I just took you along for the ride. Uh, but when, when the, it, it, again, it was a, a sunny day and the light's on it and it looks like I haven't mixed the flour in properly. You know how when you don't mix the flour in you get all these whitey bits? No, it's not. It's the sunshine coming through the window on the chocolate. So don't think I haven't mixed it in properly because it did. It was lovely. So I'm going to put that up now and I'm going to put up a little chat I had with mum about her bookies. So the two will run together and then I'll come back on board. I'll see you after that then. Well, I pop round to mum's and we're going to talk about your little job that you've got mum uh, when you were uh, in Harlow. And, oh, first of all, hello. Hello. Yes. Hello, everybody. Yeah. And you were saying that you got the job purely because of the hours, mum. Yes. The hours were from 10 o'clock till 2 o'clock because you... But then we'd found a lovely little school for you, which had a nursery, but more than a nursery, it was a, a sort of classroom, really. It was the beginning, the lowest. You started at three, and I think they went, it was a boarding school, and they went up. It was, it, it's, it was like an enormous house, you know, but it was... It's like a stately home, really, Mum, wasn't yes, it? Yes, but it was run beautifully yeah. and it was lovely yeah and you went on a, a little bus a little coach that went just went to the school picked up um the pupils and yeah. and i was able then to put you on you were only three but i was able to put you on quite safely because there were people in charge and uh, you seemed quite happy. I don't remember you ever crying or being upset. And because the hours that I, the job that I found was from ten till two, that that fitted in lovely. But the job was in a bookmaker's bookies. Yes, in a bookies, which were then private places for people that had accounts there that could ring up and put on a bet. So I used to take the bets on the phone and write down whatever the bet was and they each had um, a sort of separate file but I would take these bets down from 10 o'clock till 2 o'clock. The bookies would be out. And because your forte was maths, wasn't it? Mom? Yes. That my, so I was you good are, at figures. Yeah, good yes. at figures. And you, so you got the job. Yes. Now, it's very different to what we think about now because I was thinking, you know, were you ever tempted to put a bet on? No. But we, we had to look it all up, yes. really. Betting was illegal. Yeah. And so it was made legal to put a bet on in 1949. However, the article that I read said, although it was legal... There were betting shops in villages and towns didn't start coming on, you know, being set up yes. until the 1960s. Yes. There wasn't any betting no. shops in the town. No. So how could you put a bet no. on? So how did people put a bet no. on, Mum? My, it was just a shop as far as I can remember. Right. It was just a shop, you know, and everybody knew that that was the bookies. Yeah. And... Uh, as I say, I used to just answer the phone and take the 
the books because people had accounts there. Right. But the other um, means of book bookmaking then, uh, placing a bet or having a bet, was in the pub. So the publican used to take all the bets. Um, so the bookers would be out from 10 till 2 and one of them would always be back in time for me. Right. But they would call into the publicans to collect the bets that the publicans had put on, had taken. And the other person that was very popular to, to give a bet to, especially if you'd had um, a sandwich or something with a in a paper bag, because that person would just, that chappy would just tear the bit of the the bag, yeah. scribble on there, the dog or the horse or right. whatever, each way bet off to win and give the money to the milkman and he would wrap it up and put it in a bag and then the milkman would come and give me the bag with all the money all in. All the bits of paper All the money. bits of paper. Right, and you yes. had to make sense yes. of it all. Yes, it could have been right. a bit of cream bun or a jam donut. <laughs> Right. Or whatever, the, yeah. or a piece of just a piece of paper that shopping and it all been yes, put in whatever. paper bags. Yes. yes. So and you made sense of all these bets. Yes. But you never yes. were tempted to put a bet on yourself. No, oh, so that was your only yes. job when you lived in yes. Harlow. Yes, because okay. of the hours, and yeah. it was good money as well. Oh, it was, was good money. Yes. Yeah. Allowed me to go which, to this little yes, school. Little school, and yeah. dad, dad then was was uh, earning good money in London. So that yeah. was we were able then, to send you were. We were very happy to send you there because yeah. you certainly seemed very contented there. That's lovely. Well, yes. we'll say cheerio then. Yes, yes. so bye-bye. Yeah, see you next time. Yes. Bye. Bye. Right, so I thought you might like to join me this morning. I'm making um, a chocolate and salted caramel cake. I've never made it before, so it could be an absolutely disaster. But I thought you might like to come along. I've mixed up, now what is it, I've got the recipe here now. It's uh, 225 grams of unsalted butter and 200 grams of light brown sugar and three eggs. And so I've, I've whisked it all together in there so it's all nice light and fluffy now. I've got to put in a teaspoon of vanilla and so I use this, I like it, vanilla bean, it's lovely. So if I can open it, all right, I'm going to put a teaspoon in. That's half a teaspoon. That's one teaspoon. Get it all off, it's so precious, isn't it? That's it. Right, let's give that a little mix. Now I will say here that it's curdled a bit. So we'll see, if the cake's rubbish, we'll know it can't curdle. But you know, often mine do. Right, I'll just put that over there. And I'm now going to add the chocolate. I'm using Bourneville chocolate and do you know what, it's so gorgeous. I mean, you know, you can't help but try it, can you? It is so lovely. Such a lovely flavour. I usually get green and blacks, but this is gorgeous. It was so much cheaper. But, oh, I shall buy it from now on. Oh, see? You just don't know what to... Later. All right, later. Later. Now, I made my own buttermilk, uh, but I just squeezed some lemon juice in there and it gives it a bit of a... Well, it's called buttermilk. I think it's like using a creme fraiche in a way. So that goes in too. Oh, yes, it's curdled. You want to see it? There we are. Looks a bit of a mess, doesn't it? But now we've got the dry ingredients, so let's hope that that makes a difference. So what have I got for the dry ingredients? Right. So I've got self-raising flour. Okay. I've got to sift that. Right. 
Oh, I haven't weighed out my cocoa. Don't worry, don't worry, I'll do it. And a quarter of a teaspoon of bicarb. So a quarter of a teaspoon, well, that's not much, is it? Oh, I can never open these things, can you? Oh, I did it. Right, quarter of a teaspoon is not much. I know that's what that that, that buttermilk does. It it combats the um, bicarb. So I'm putting in that much, quarter of a teaspoon. Okay, fair dues. And then how much cocoa powder? Fifty grams. I'm gonna weigh that out. That's all right. I can do that while I'm talking to you. No rush, is there? Okay. I use the green and black, so I love it. 50. It's going to be quite a lot, I think. Well, it's a chocolate and salted caramel after all. Oh, that's 50. Forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine. Oops, fifty-five, fifty-four, fifty-two, fifty-two, fifty-one, fifty-two. How can it be more when I'm taking it off? Fifty-one, fifty. Mighty ho. Okie doke then. See, I always get mucky. Right, that's the 50, that's the, they're all washed and clean and they're not, they're not licked. Okay, hands were made to use. And a quarter of a teaspoon of fine salt. Wow, I've got a bag of fine salt here. Pete uses it for something or other. So a quarter of a teaspoon isn't much, is it? There we are. I'm just going to put that in. Okay, now I've got to sift that in. It's brightening up. It was very overcast this morning. I was supposed to go out for a walk with my friend. But we called it off. It was damp and cloudy. We wanted to go down the 39 steps and have the sea sparkly, but it wasn't today. So I thought, all right, I'll get on and just make this cake. Because what I like to do with cakes is cut them up, put them in the freezer. And I've got them for a little bit whenever we fancy it or if anybody comes around which they don't often do, obviously, now. However, we did say, I did say to my friend, if you fancy coming for Sunday lunch, she's going to do a test. She's very tired. She has a very demanding job, and it's a difficult job. And so we've asked around for Sunday lunch, and if this works out well, then I might um, see how it defrosts and... She might have that for after. She might not. She likes lemon meringue pie, so I might make her that. Anyway, la la la, here we go. Let's get this out of the way. Oh, this is all the dry ingredients in here now. So I'm just going to fold it in, just gently. And that's it, really. Then I put it in a tray and cook it. I'll let you know what I cook it at. That wasn't hard, just shove everything in. That's what I like. I shove everything in one. And Bob's your uncle, you're done. Let's see if it works. Ah, because that was quite runny. There was a lot of wet ingredients in there, wasn't there? This is coming together now. I've got to stand up. Oh, it smells divine. I just want to eat it. That, that takes a bit of mixing. But I think we're there. That's what it looks like. Right, so I've got my tin 
here it is. I just shoved a bit of, um, you know, baking parchment on it. I'm just going to put this in. It looks divine. And I have hardly got any washing up. Well, it was so easy because just all in, you know. So I'm putting that in. Let me see if I can show you. This filming lark's not that easy. Some make, people make it look so beautifully easy. Not me. Let's get it all out. Can I lick the bowl, Mum? Well, uh, of course you can. Right, there we are. Get every last bit. Oh, I've got to lick it. No, I'll put it back there. And now I'm going to put that into the corner. Put that, if I put it there, you can see. Put that in the corners. Oh, it's a nice lot of mixture. And even it all. There we are. There it is, all in the tray. So I'm gonna pop it in the oven, 180 degrees for, well, till it's cooked. I'll let you know when. And in the meantime, I'm going to make some, I'm gonna ask Pete for the recipe. Can you sort that recipe out for me, Pete? Bichel Roux, you know, I'm gonna try the custard. Got a bit on the bowl. I mean, you can see. I'm, I'm just going to have to lick that. So I'm going to put this in, lick that, and then I'm going to make the um, custard. I'll, we'll see how that all goes. So do you want to lick this bowl? Yeah. Take it over there. Oh, you lick, lick most of it. I'm no, sorry. I haven't. I haven't touched it. <laughs> right, let's do this custard. <sighs> you need a bag of rain, really. Hang on. Oh. What is it, man? Whisk the egg yolks, one third of sugar, put the milk, vanilla and remaining sugar in the saucepan, stir with the whisk, bring to the boil, pour the milk onto the eggs, return the mixture to the pan and cook gently. Remove the vanilla pod, pour the sauce into a clean bowl. Did you like that? Very nice. Well, I'm not going to do the creme anglaise because that other creme anglaise that I made was absolutely beautiful. But Pete just said, oh, I'm not keen with it with flour in it. But with this recipe, you just use six egg yolks, 125 grams of sugar, some vanilla and 500 ml of milk, which is absolutely great because obviously what thickens it is the extra egg yolks. But I don't want to use six egg yolks this morning. So when I do make a pavlova, which I do, then I'm going to make, use the egg yolks to make a creme anglaise. But I'm not going to do that today. Otherwise, we're going to have creme anglaise, chocolate cake and, and pavlova to eat. So I shall do that next week or whenever it's suitable, you know. Yeah. Right, well, it's out the oven. It only took 20 minutes. I mean, honestly, I haven't got any mess in the kitchen. And this is it. It's, oh, there we are. It's come up beautifully. That's, the knife's clean with that. And now I'm going to let it cool and you put caramel on topping on it. Oh, thanks, love. Just press done on the left. I've done that. Oh, these things. Um, oh, it's this one, that'd be it. And so what you what you do is you you um, put your sugar in the saucepan, let it go to caramel, then you you know all of that. Put in your double cream and your butter. But I'm just going to cheat today. I thought I'll try it. And so this is salted caramel sauce, and it says let the cake get cold. Of course, Mimi's is impatient, doesn't want to, but I'm going to. I'm going to let it get cold. I'm going to put this on and with just a dribble of. Um, 
melted chocolate, so I'll come back in a minute. Oh, it's all come back in a minute this morning, isn't it? I didn't come back in a minute because I pressed photo and not video. But what I did was I, I spread it on and it all went sort of, not a thick icing, it just melted over. And then I drizzled 30 grams of chocolate on. And then I thought, oh, I'll take a photo and show you. But of course, I was taking a photo of that anyway, so it was all rubbish. So you didn't see me doing the chocolate. This happens to me all the time. Here it is, though. It does look a mess. However, would you like to try a bit, Pete? Hey? Would you like to try a bit? Oh, you've done already. Well, this is such an easy bake. This, well, we'll see. We might not like it. We might not like it. I can't have any music on, can I? I know, hang on. Pete, Hello. could you just get a plate? Mm. Right, let's try it. Oh, let's try it. I can't wait. Mm. Oh, I love it. What do you think? Oh, it's gorgeous. Is it? Oh, why, what don't you like about it? Nothing. Well, it's nice. I like it. It's all right. It's nice, but it's not... I think it's a chocolate. <laughs> Honestly. It's strong enough. Oh, but that's what I like about it. That it's not too sweet. It's not... No. That no. is really chocolatey. Maybe it's me. Maybe it is you, but no, that's that's a lovely salted caramel chocolate cake without being too sweet, without being sickly. It's not sickly. At no, all. not at all sickly, is no. it? But it's not that grown-up flavour. You know how sometimes you make a chocolate cake, yeah, and good. it's a real grown-up flavour. This isn't. No. Children would love this. I love it. Oh, that's going to go in squares in the freezer. Look at, Look at that pigeon, he's just landed on the um, on the tree and the whole tree's swaying, he came yeah. in such a whoosh. Anyway, it's, how I would sum that up is, oh, a beautiful chocolate. <laughs> Not enough chocolate. Not enough chocolate. Well, you can put more chocolate on the top. Yeah. Look, I've got more chocolate left, would you like me to put more chocolate on the top? No, it's all right. No, it is gorgeous. That's, you'll have to make it and try it for yourself. So there we are. Chat with Mum, which was lovely. Well, if, if any of... Well, people, of course, do know my mum, but she's a very quiet lady. She's very quiet and thoughtful. She's 96 in June, June the 7th, so it's not too long, and... She's lost her sight. I don't think you'd know either of those things unless I told you. But you know, it's it's a joy. And I know it's evoked memories for some of you um, with your mums and, and your nans. And, and yeah, it, so I do appreciate being with her. I really do. And I, I'm glad that you've said that in a good way, it's been nice, recalled nice memories for you. So, that was the chocolate cake, wasn't it? And that was the chat with mum. So we're moving on to Tottenham next time. Blank sheet. Yeah. So there's only TA left in the film. And so I'll get on with TA, shall I? And then I'll tell you about the film. Now, we're just doing about... This started in episode 12. And I'm taking you through slowly. Um, transactional analysis is a great way that we can learn and we can think and we can change things. I found it very helpful in my work as a counsellor. So just if you've joined me recently, you've joined me just as in, in a, a, a part that's called time structuring. And this week, we're going to talk about games. I expect you've heard games people play and people do play games don't they 
And uh, yeah, what we want to do is not join in the game. So how do you know you've been part of a game? Well, you both feel bad at the end of it. You don't get anywhere. You think, what was that? What? What? It, it, it's not resolved. It's like a game that's going to continue. And what happens is things seem all right. Then somebody might start blaming. Somebody might start saying, oh, this isn't right for me. Oh, and it all gets mixed, muddled, and it's horrible. And we all play games from time to time. So a game I could think about telling you that I got involved with, I think I might have mentioned it before, but it seems to fit here. When I was out and about, oh, my daughter had moved away, an hour's drive away, and uh, with my three grandchildren, and they subsequently got married. And somebody said to me when I was out one day, oh, hello, here you've got a new grandchild on the way. And I said, have I? I didn't know that. And they said, oh, yes, haven't you heard? Oh, she's moved away. She doesn't keep in touch. I felt dreadful. Oh, I said, yes, she does keep in touch. I came home. I said to Pete, we've got a new grandchild on the way. And Kim hasn't told us. Well, he said. I said, will you phone her and see if it's true? I can't face it. He said, no, I'm not phoning. I'm going to let her phone us. <laughs> It's a game. Can you see the game starting? Childhood things. We're in child, aren't we? He's in negative, rebellious. That's where he goes, rebellious. I go into adapted. I can't face phoning her, but negative. Um, and we both sit there and I get tearful and I say, make me a cup of tea. And we have a cup of tea. I said, oh, I think, oh, what should we do? He said, look, we'll just wait. Let's just wait and see. And I was getting upset. And Pete and I were playing the game as this other person had played the game. It all felt wrong. It felt horrible. It was getting nowhere. Obviously, we'll talk about games a lot more so that you can understand it. But have you ever been in that situation where things are just like that? Of course, I had a cup of tea and I thought about it. And I snapped out of negative adapted child. And I got into adult. Adult is the here and now. And I said, I don't know if this is true. I don't know if even the person who said that to me knows it's true. The only way we're going to find out is if we ask. So I got into adult, not child. Oh, I didn't know. I got into adult and I messaged my daughter. I said, I hear... Congratulations are in order. Is it true? She came back to me and she said, What's that, Mum? And then she thought that her daughter hadn't told her. And long and the short of it all, it wasn't true. It wasn't true at all. And we all had a jolly good laugh, which felt right. And we all said, We need a brandy now. But you see, if I hadn't got into adult and stopped the game, it would have gone on and on. So they're not healthy and we really, if you don't know how to get into adult, if you don't know what adult is, that game could continue. Oh, well, I'm not going to say anything. I'll let them do it. La, la, la. Get into adult. Find out. We did have a laugh and it was good. So it all ended well. But I think it's quite an easy way of explaining what a game is. It doesn't feel right. Things that are said aren't right. And it's because they're bought from childhood. Yeah. And so that's where we go. Pete went into rebellious child, negative rebellious child. Oh, well, I think we'll just wait until she tells us. <laughs> and I went, oh, no, why is it she telling me? Get into adult, you find out the truth, and there you are. Things are much better. So that's our TA for this week. And uh, next week, it's the last part. And it's intimacy. So we'll talk about that and then I'm going to go over and have a resume of what we've learned so far for those that are interested. For those that aren't, I put timestamps along the bottom and you can just fast forward this bit. I know some of you aren't 
and that's easy isn't it just fast forward but I know some of you are and it has made a big difference so I'm glad so the last bit is to introduce the film and the film this week is just what we say well when I was cooking I looked out the window and there's quite a few birds so I just popped that in and then what we do is we walk into town and we get out a little bit of shopping we got some meat Pete's got a bag on his back that's far too heavy but we got out walked into town walked back we walk along the beach and back very nice it was a mild day mild January day well it was a few days ago and it was quite a shock because down the high street which is very narrow down the high street dee da dee da oh that reminds me my dad used to call my eldest daughter dee da because I think she used to play dee da dee da and he always called her dee da I'd forgotten that up until now anyway dee da dee da six fire engines police cars round the corner oh it, it stirred me and uh, I said to Pete oh that's the technical college on fire and it was one of the workroom things had gone up and um, they got it under control pretty quickly but that's the smoke that you can see in the little film so it's something and nothing but it's just something to round off this week so yeah I'll see you next week bye take care and uh, happy crafting Yeah.